Okay, take it away, Luke. Great, thank you so much, Donna. And uh, yeah, thank you for uh, inviting me to come and be a part of, of your guys' program. Really fun to hear all the different birds that you guys are seeing there in Pennsylvania. I've only been there one time before uh, earlier last year, went on a family vacation. We went to Gettysburg and drove around up there. But I've never been to Pennsylvania. I don't know if you've ever been to Arizona or Tucson, Southeast Arizona before, um, but it is warmer here. And uh, so you think about that uh, next time you think about where you're going to be traveling. We'd love to see you down here in Southeast Arizona. What we're going to talk about today is some of uh, Arizona's most wanted birds. What makes this area down here so special? Um, you know, I first visited uh, Tucson, Arizona in 2009 on a vacation with my wife. She wanted to go somewhere hot. I wanted to go somewhere where there were a lot of birds. and um, so I was like, hey, Tucson's pretty hot. We're going to take our vacation in June and definitely hot. And I talked my wife into going. And um, so we did a lot of birding. She's not a birder. But we did a lot of birding when we were there in June of 2009. Came away just uh, smitten with the area. The, uh, the canyons, the hikes, just everything about Tucson we loved. We were like, we're going to live here someday. We thought we would retire. Uh, but we couldn't wait till retirement age. We decided to move down to Tucson in uh, actually December of 2014 and then um, got plugged in right away with the local birding uh, community with Tucson Audubon. Um, this way you get to know people. So I got plugged in and ended up with a, with a job after a couple of years. And so, uh, yeah, right now I'm director of engagement and education and I've uh, been working on staff at Tucson Audubon since 2016. This is me uh, leading a group of folks at, at, like it was said, my favorite birding spot is Sweetwater Wetlands. It's an old wastewater treatment plant area that's been turned into an ecotourism spot. And we lead uh, field trips there every Wednesday morning. I've been doing that since, yeah, since January of 2015. I love birding like the same locations over and over again. Uh, to just to get a feel for the area and get to know the birds. And um, sometimes you get a little bored when you do that for, I guess, what, eight years now, but it's still uh, really special. Uh, this was a picture taken back in, uh, it was November of 2019, uh, the Wednesday before Thanksgiving. And we're all hold, holding up our little elegant Trogan stickers. Um, Tucson Audubon's mission is to inspire people to protect and enjoy birds. And I really think like the best way to do that is to get people outside and go birding with them. And so before the pandemic, we we're having regularly this many people on the field trips I was doing, sometimes 50, 60 people. Uh, they're a lot, they're kind of smaller now, <laughs> gone through different versions of that. Uh, but I love it. I love uh, connecting people to, uh, to each other and to birds. And found this is a, a great way of doing it. And this area, that I live in Tucson, Arizona and Southeast Arizona it really is, it's amazing when it comes to the bird life. You know, I'm hearing about the different birds you're seeing there, winter wren, um, bald eagles. And, uh, you know, we, we don't get very many bald eagles. Winter wren is a rare bird that we get every once in a while. Um, some of the highlighted birds that I've been seeing down here lately have been like mountain plover, bend iris thrasher, um, let's see, we had a northern perula, so that, that was kind of exciting. And of course, we're going we're to look at some really special ones that Arizona is known for here pretty soon. But to give you an idea of what makes this area so amazing, let's think about bird diversity. And so this map right here, what makes birding in southeast Arizona so special, you see uh, this map of the United States shows density of uh, birds bird species, density of uh, diversity of bird species. So the red is higher diversity, the green blue is lower diversity, and then the yellow is kind of in between, you can see that. Um, so when you look at where the highest diversity is at, the red, what do you notice is like a common element that's connected with the red? By the ocean, right? You got water, you got along the California coast, nice and red to get 
along the Pacific Ocean. You can see Texas all the way around the Gulf Coast, the, the Gulf of Mexico. And then you can see the red all the way up the Atlantic coast. So like the birds diversity, when you have it right next to the ocean, really high. Now, you can see this little splotch of red down here in Southeast Arizona, it's Southwest New Mexico. Now, you, you may have heard of a song, you know, Oceanfront Property in Arizona. Uh, that, that, that's a lie, if you don't know that already. <laughs> <laughs> so there's no ocean here in Arizona and New Mexico. Uh, so what makes this area so amazing? Like, uh, let's see why here. Well, actually, before I show you why, let's look at it this way too. So there's around, this is the, all these numbers are from eBird. And uh, there's around 1,100 species that have been found anywhere in the United States. And you can see over here on the right, some different states uh, that are prominent. And then I added Pennsylvania in there too, for you guys, 448 species in Pennsylvania. Uh, the most is 705 species in California. And so usually I ask people, okay, where, where's Arizona at in this? You got 558 in New Mexico, that's pretty surprising. Arizona fits in right between Texas and New Mexico with 559. I'm, I went and double checked it today because I have to update my numbers every so often. And um, I'm a little bit, I, I gotta, I'm hoping that Arizona stays in front of New Mexico. It's a little tight right there. <laughs> so hopefully that stays true. But we're ahead of New Mexico, right behind California and Texas with diversity of species within our state. And here's why. Here's why New Mexico and Arizona are so amazing when it comes to is bird diversity. Uh, so you got this whole different mess of, of habitats and ecosystems and massive deserts and mountains that are all converging together in Southeast Arizona. You have uh, the Rocky Mountains coming in from the north to the south. And so you have this big Rocky Mountain influence that comes into some of our mountain ranges. Uh, our mountain ranges down here in uh, Southeast Arizona are called Sky Islands. So they come up uh, just, you know, you, you have the valleys and then all of a sudden this massive mountain range pokes up and then you have all these distinct mountain ranges all around Southeast Arizona, they're called Sky Islands. So our Northern Sky Islands have a real Rocky Mountain influence. And then our Southern ones have a Sierra Madre influence. So the Sierra Madre is just like the Rocky Mountains, a, a huge uh, mountain range, long mountain range that extends all the way down from Sonora down into uh, further south of Mexico. And then it comes up just into southeast Arizona and southwest New Mexico. And so when you have these two different mountain ranges coming together, are, are you able to hear me all right, Donna? I see you guys. Yeah, talking. you're you're perfect. But we actually have a question. Um, Luke. Oh um, shoot! Yeah, go for it. I don't know if I couldn't hear you well enough, but can you explain the Sky Islands again? Because yeah, yeah, yeah for ahead. sure. Thank you. Yeah, so Sky Islands are a really unique thing for for our area, Southeast Arizona and Southwest New Mexico. Most of the time, when you have mountain ranges like the Cascade Mountains or the Appalachian Mountains or the Rocky Mountains. You know, they extend for, I mean, they're, they're long and they travel through multiple states and all that. So our mountain ranges, while they're big, they're concentrated. So you have, actually, I'll show you. Let me uh, change my screen share and I'm going to go over here and I'm just going to pull up Google Maps and I'm going to show you what, what I mean by, by this. Okay, so here's here's Tucson right here. This is Southeast Arizona. And these green spots kind of, they represent uh, Coronado National Forest Land. So basically mountain ranges. This part of Tucson right here, this Northeast of Tucson, this is the Catalina Mountains. And here, I'm actually gonna change the layer here. So you can see right here, this is the Catalina Mountain Range. 
it has a really distinct um, uh, influence from the Rocky Mountains. Does have a little bit of the Sierra Madres coming up into it as well. So this is one range, the Catalinas. And then right over here on the eastern side of Tucson is a whole nother mountain range called the Rincon Mountains. And so it's also kind of influ it's, it's influenced by both, but to different degrees. Now, if you just go a little south of Tucson, this mountain range right here, this is where Madera Canyon is. So if you've ever heard of Madera Canyon, it's a very well-known hotspot. This mountain range is called the Santa Rita Mountains. It has an even greater degree of Sierra Madre influence than Rocky Mountains. For instance, and I'll show you in an upcoming slide, when it comes to our chickadees. So over there in Pennsylvania, I think you have Carolina and black cap chickadees. I think they kind of converge right there, if I remember right. Maybe you're more black cap, I can't remember. But here, the chickadees that we have here, in the Catalina Mountains, we have mountain chickadee. In the Santa Rita's, we actually don't have any chickadees. The mountain chickadees don't reach all the way down here. So if you, you just won't see any chickadees in the Santa Rita's. But if you move over just a little bit to the east, to this mountain range here, this is the Chiricahuas. No mountain chickadees, but you will get Mexican chickadee. So it has an even greater influence of Sierra Madres. So in this whole section of Southeast Arizona, you have all these different mountain ranges, the Patagonias, the Whetstones, the Chiricahuas, the Pinaleños, the Rincons, and each one has like different types of bird species. Mountain chickadees here, Mexican chickadees down here, no chickadees over here. And I'll show you some other birds where it does that too. And so they just pop up these mountain ranges and then the valleys, they just drastic. So if you drive from Tucson up to Mount Lemmon here, you're starting at like 2,000 foot elevation. And in about half an hour, you're up to 8,500 foot elevation. So you go through all these different eco zones from Sonoran Desert up to uh, oak grassland, ponderosa pine, Madrean evergreen, and then basically like Canadian boreal evergreen. Uh, so that's what I mean by um, by those. I can't even think of the, the Scott Islands of Southeast Arizona. That that's what you'll hear of there. So let me go back to the share. So not only do we have those mountain ranges converging where we're at, we also have three different deserts converging. So we have a very heavy Sonoran desert habitat that very unique to the area that we live in. in and then from the east and the southeast, you have the Chihuahuan Desert, which comes in from Texas to New Mexico and comes in from the east to the west. That brings in a whole different set of birds like scaled quail and um, Chihuahuan raven, Chihuahuan meadowlark. And then you have the uh, influence from Mojave Desert too. So that's like Macomb Thrasher, Ben Dyer Thrasher, uh, Bell Sparrow those sort of things. And if other questions pop up, feel free to just interrupt me and we can go with that. We'll have time for questions at the end too. So here's what I, I was saying about like how these different mountain ranges uh, and deserts all converge. We talked about the chickadees, mountain chickadees in the Catalina Mountains, no chickadees in San Rita's and Mexican chickadee and the Chiricahuas. It's the same thing with something like quail, or you could talk about it with woodpeckers as well. But quail is really another really indicator species. So Gamble's quail is definitely a Sonoran Desert specialty species. And so in and around Tucson, you see Gamble's quail all over the place. Uh, you won't see scaled quail though, but you just have to go just a little bit to the east, maybe about 40 minutes, and you'll start getting all the Chihuahua and Desert influence and you start seeing scaled quail intermixed with the Gamble's quail and eventually it just becomes all scaled quail. If you go up into a little higher elevation, there'll be another quail and we're gonna talk about that other species here in a little bit. But it's just really interesting how everything converges together 
And then, so what happens is that you have a wide variety of species in a area, you know, traveling an hour and a half, you can see totally different birds in another place. So it's pretty amazing. And um, people come from all over the world to come and check out the birds in the Tucson area. Before I talk about hummingbirds, any questions on any of that? Yeah, um, in the chat, Lisa asked, where do you see the scaled quail? Oh, yeah. Yeah, so scaled quail, mostly in the Chihuahuan Desert habitat. And uh, so they like grasslands. And they're, at, you know, they're kind of hard to find when you're just looking at the grasslands. But when you can get, get grasslands next to a golf course, my favorite spot to see him is at the um, the golf course in Wilcox, Arizona. It's right next to a, a big lake, and that the water for the lake it comes from the golf course runoff. But then the skill quail, either early in the morning or late in the afternoon, they go and feed out on the golf course. You can see them running around with chihuahua meadowlarks, and right now in the winter, a lot of American widgeon out there feeding, and um, killdeer and you have this big mix of widgeon and killdeer and scaled quail and metal arcs. It's pretty amazing. But normally when people think about Tucson and Southeast Arizona, they don't think so much about the quail. They think about the hummingbirds. And this is my favorite hummingbird. This is a violet crowned hummingbird. It's got its neck kind of this picture was taken in the winter and I think it's, its neck is in a little bit. Maybe it's trying to stay warm or something. Usually they're pretty slender and kind of elongated hummingbirds. This guy's all scrunched in though. But just uh, this is a, a nice green plumage violet crown hummingbird with a real white throat and breast and belly and the oh, it's just it's just striking. And so um, uh, Tucson is really like called the hummingbird mecca of the United States. We have in the right time of year, which the best time for me, I think hummingbirds is like July and August and September, uh, kind of when fall migration is coming. And uh, we have some weird different hummingbirds that are sticking around and showing up in weird places like white-eared hummingbird or Caroline hummingbird, plain cap star throat. And then you just have this during our monsoon season. So you have this proliferation of food resources and um, but you, you can see up to like 12, 13 hummingbird species in one day, along with that violet crown, Ripley's hummingbird, it used to be called Magnificent Hummingbird, which I think is a much better name. It's a Magnificent Ripley's Hummingbird right here. A nice male. These are usually in higher elevations. So uh, depending on the elevation that you're at, really depend, it, it'll depend on, you know, uh, higher elevation, you'll get broad-tailed and Ripley's Hummingbird lower elevation and you'll get constant hummingbird and violet crown. So um, that plays a big role on the types of bird species that you'll see is what kind of elevation, what kind of habitat you're in. My favorite spot to see the hummingbirds in Southeast Arizona is the Patton Center for Hummingbirds. Whether you could go there right now in the dead of winter, see three different species, violet crown, broad build, and endless hummingbird. Um, but I said April, April's really good, uh, but then again in July, August, and September, you have to taunt them, but the birding is also outstanding. You can see here's some quick eBird stats for the Patent Center for Hummingbirds, 251 species seen there, almost 20,000 checklists. It's probably at 20,000 now since I, uh, since I made this. Uh, April, highest uh, diversity of species, so not just hummingbirds, but all sorts of other species, uh, orioles and flycatchers and buntings, the list goes on and on. And uh, the Pan Center for Hummingbirds, if you're familiar with it, it's pretty well known. Um, you know, birding location, uh, it was um, back in the 70s and 80s, it was the backyard of um, Wally and Marion Patton. And uh, they had hummingbird feeders in their backyard then, and they noticed a really special hummingbird called that the violet crown hummingbird coming to their feeders. And um, they had uh, birders come by to look into the yard instead of 
putting a fence up around it. They mm -hmm. actually put up different chairs and, mm -hmm. and put up tents so that people could sit under the tents and watch the hummingbirds with their fingers and open up their backyard. After their passing, with the help of uh, amazing generosity and donors, um, Tucson Audubon was able to purchase that. And so we run hummingbirds down. And we get to go there uh, at least once a month and watch the hummingbirds. Here's a couple other. These are uh, hummingbirds from my backyard. Uh, Bill and Bob, that's what my wife named them, just Anna's hummingbird and a broadfield hummingbird. These are year round, right in Tucson. Um, like I said, my wife's not a birder, but she does like to name things. So I'm gonna mm -hmm. put those in there. Mm -hmm. uh, along with hummingbirds, one thing that people may not know is that uh, this area is amazing for night birds. The best time for night birds really starts at the end of March and goes through the first part of June. Uh, we have elf owls that come at the end of March. Uh, this owl, this is a whispered screech owl. Here's what it sounds like. So you can hear that. It's kind of like, a, they call it a Morse, Morse code call. Uh, but I love going up the Madera Canyon, which is in the Santa Rita Mountains in April. Um, mid to late April, and I go up to the very top, walking about oh, 300 yards to a bench, and sitting there as, as it gets dark and listening to uh, Mexican whippoorwills and northern pygmy owls and whiskered screech owls calling all around. Just a really amazing, amazing thing to take in. Uh, you don't even have to see them to, to just love it. Um, but yeah, also buff colored night jar is really, uh, special bird that we have down here that you can't really see anywhere else in the United States. Um, but I love the birds. So here's another one. So, uh, you know, while the night birds are very uh, specific, you have to, you know, put yourself in very specific spots, go and find the night birds. Of course, you can get great horned owls and barn owls in town. Um, and so they're, a little bit harder to, to find, but here's one that anyone can go and find at just about any park in Tucson. It's a brilliant vermilion flycatcher. This is a, a picture that my my son took when he was like seven or eight. Like it's just so easy. They're everywhere, just about every park. And um, I love to take people to see vermilion flycatchers. And this is one I'm eating a, a moth. And um, it's also the logo of Tucson Audubon. So if you see Tucson Audubon anywhere, it's got the, the male red vermilion flycatcher that really sticks out. The female, not so red. This is a female vermilion flycatcher right here. And it's really one of the, like, so I do, I do a thing. Um, I, I do a lot of these virtual events, lead a lot of these myself. One of my favorite virtual events to lead is called Tips on Identifying Birds. And um, people, I encourage people who sign up to send me pictures of different birds that they um, have trouble identifying or, you know, kind of want to talk through. So I put the picture up and we talk through the identification process. You know, lots of coopers and sharp shin hawks, seas, BBs. But this is another one that I get so often is the female vermilion flycatcher. We do these virtual sessions uh, on tips on identifying birds. About every other month, we have another one coming up on March 2nd. But they're free to join. Uh, and they're Zoom, so anyone can join. You know, if you want to go to our website and sign up for a virtual event like that, you're more than welcome to do so. I do another virtual event called Where to Go Birding in Southeast Arizona. And I do that like kind of on that every other month as well to talk about some of the specific locations. And later on at, at the end of the talk, I can, if you have any questions about specific locations, you can ask me, but I do go into that um, on those talks quite a bit too. But this female vermilion, uh, had to make sure you get a, a picture of a female bird on here, so. So beyond hummingbirds, if, if you're a birder and you're thinking about going to Southeast Arizona, this is the bird that ultimately always comes up. 
This is like the holy grail of birds that are most wanted in Arizona. This is the elegant trogan. Again, this is the male elegant trogan. And uh, this parrot like bird. I thought I had, um, maybe I have it on the next slide. Uh, it's called. So not only is it a beautiful red and green and white and yellow bird, but it also has like this amazing trope like call. I'm pretty sure I have it on the next slide. Let's see if I do. Ooh, I do. All right, let's listen to that. It's it's kind of the call is like um, a mixture of a turkey, a dog, a seal, and a frog. And you put those all together, and this is what it sounds like. So hopefully you all will be able to hear this pretty well. And you're just walking along the Central Line Canyon, and all of a sudden you hear it. And you would think, with as colorful as they are, you would be able to see it really easily. But that, that's not not always the case. It, it's they, they could be notoriously hard to find. It took me uh, when I first moved here. I was like, oh, I gotta see an elegant trogon. Because I didn't see one when I visited back in 09. I missed it. And, you know, I was always looking way up in the trees, but evidently it, they aren't real low. They aren't real high. They're usually like mid level. And um, they can be just super hard, even just how colorful they are. They just blend in with the shadow and everything. And then I'll be at, like, at mid level in the sycamore line, the drain, evergreen. It's like mid air canyon or sycamore canyon. In the Patagonias, um, in Ramsey Canyon. So they'll sit there like motionless, and then all of a sudden they'll flutter down the ground, pick up a caterpillar, and come back up to their spot and eat their caterpillar. And I was with my wife at Gonia Lake State Park when we saw our first one. And there was one that was overwintering there. They came to help us, and uh, yeah, that was that was amazing. And so. Most birders, when they come, they really want to see this elegant trogan. We have a few that overwinter, not very many. Um, they're most often seen like May through August into September. And so we hold our Southeast Arizona Birding Festival in, in August because most of the birds that we talk about here is when it's easiest to see it. Uh, even though it is hot, monsoon rains like cool it down. It's amazing. Um, Tucson Audubon does a lot of uh, bird survey work. Um, and so one of the, the, the birds that we do a lot of surveys for is elegant trogons. You can see some of the numbers here. Um, the numbers dropped big time in 2021. We had a, a very um, impactful drought that happened um, summer of 2020 through 2021. And really this year, season signs are coming out of it. Um, but it really affected both the bird populations and I think the timing for when those birds came back up into our area. So we did notice that trogans came in a little bit later than normal the past couple of years. But you can see our numbers dropped from 201 in 2020, all the way down to 68 in 21 and 121 last year. So um, 18, 19 to 20, those numbers are all pretty high and then they kind of took a nosedive and hopefully we'll see them come back. But um, we do a lot of work for them and try to preserve their habitat and advocate for them. There's some different mining projects that are going on in some of their areas. So um, yeah, it's important work to survey for those birds. Hey Luke. Have you ever seen the elegant program before? No one. All right. Dorothy. Okay. okay. Yeah, just one person. Just one person. Oh, we need to change that. All right. Well, let's move. So this little guy right here, Lucy's Warbler, not as colorful. Hey, Luke, hold on one sec, because there's a question um, or a comment. Yeah. Um, Al, Al asked, is California Gulch the only place to get buff collared nightjars? It used to, well, no, it's not. So um, there's another place, 
another location called Brown Canyon, which is uh, in Buenos Aires National Wildlife Refuge. It's about an hour and a half southwest of Tucson. It's kind of not too far from California Gulch, a little bit more accessible. Um, but yeah, you, you can get them in a couple different places now. Um, there's something about going to California Gulch, though, if, if, if you've ever heard, um, I think like Ken Coffin mentions it in his Kingbird Highway. I think he goes there a couple times. Uh, just kind of got put on the radar kind of about that time that he was doing that. It's a, it's a pretty magical place. It's right along the border. It's there's something about going and exploring that area that, you know, Brown King is just a, a gravel road off the highway. It's not as, um, it, I mean, it's great, but it's not as magical as California Gulch. I would just say that. Thanks. Yep. So Lucy's Warbler, uh, not, not one that, people normally think of, but I want to put Lucy's on here for a couple of reasons. One is that it is very range restricted. It's very tied to uh, mesquite trees, especially the velvet mesquite here in the Sonoran Desert. And um, it's it's a bird that um, has a beautiful song and I should have included the song on here. I can't believe I forgot that. Um, but the other reason I want to include it is because Tucson Audubon does a lot of work for Lucy's warblers, uh, they're the only. Uh, there's only two uh, cavity nesting warblers in all of the United States, and Lucy's warbler is one of them. The other being the prothonotary warbler. And up to until about uh, six or seven years ago, when we started doing a lot of research on this, they weren't known to use nest boxes. And so we were trying to figure out a way for this really range restricted Lucy's warbler, who was losing range because of uh, really loss of habitat. How do we help lose these warblers right here in Tucson, right in urban areas? And so um, we're like, well, other cavity nesters use nest boxes. Why doesn't lose these warblers? And so we started doing a lot of research. We found that you can see it's this nest box right here. It's actually kind of triangle shaped and um, it has openings on either side. And we found that Lucy's warblers do in fact use this specific type of nest box that we created. And so we do a lot of work to um, uh, raise awareness to our local community to put up nest boxes for Lucy's warblers in the ski trees. And we've seen a, a, like a dramatic success story of all this. So we do a lot of work with schools to build Lucy's warbler nest boxes and get them hung up and Built mesquite trees all around the area. And uh, while it may not be like a really flashy bird, it's one that you won't see really anywhere else unless you come to the Snoran Desert habitat here in Tucson. There are some more um, flashy warblers. We, we don't get as many warblers as we do out there in the east, but we do have some pretty nice ones. So here's, here's sorry, my wife is talking in the background. Hopefully it's not distracting. Um, this one right here is probably my favorite. It's the red-faced warbler. And for red-faced warbler, they won't nest here in the urban areas. You have to go high elevation. So especially like in the Catalina Mountains on the northeast side of Tucson. Uh, real high, so like you get in the evergreen forest. And they have these um, amazing red faces. And as they fly away, they have like black and white in their tails. Uh, just a, a really dramatic uh Bird species they nest on the ground actually. They're, they're ground nesters. And here's another one with a lot of red on it. It's a painted red stripe. It's another higher elevation warbler. A lot of our probably highest diversity of warblers here is high elevation. So like if you come in August, you'll get red faced warbler, painted red star, Townsend's warbler, Kermit warbler, Grace's warbler, black and green warbler, a few others as well. These are my favorite red face and painted red star. Uh, I guess I like the color red. So I didn't realize that while I was putting that together. I didn't include any of the like graces or permit that had the yellow. Um, but so we may not have the warblers like Ohio or maybe even Pennsylvania, but uh, we do have a few of them. 
So I mentioned earlier about the quail. There's another really special quail that we have. We have, I mean, of course, gambles and scale quail are very special as well. You go a little higher in elevation, like in the um, oak grassland area and, and higher as well. You'll get this guy. This is Montezuma quail. They are notoriously hard to see. They're notoriously hard to find. It's a hard bird to get. Uh, I know a lot of people who live down here who haven't even seen one yet. You just gotta, like the Montezuma quail, kind of find you. That's how it works. And here's, I didn't take this. This is not my picture right here. This is my picture. <laughs> this is this is how I often see him. Like this is a female. I don't even know if you can see it. I'm circling it right now, but they're kind of middle right of the picture. This is how I normally see him. A female scurrying away from me. Uh, we also partner with a lot of different organizations trying to um, restore and create new habitat for mons and quail. Mons quail, a lot of people, a lot of hunters call them mons quail down here. Well, at Flock of the Patent Center, we're growing specific plants um, to have there at the Patent Center and then transplant into other areas uh, to make new habitat for Montezuma quail. It's a tough one. It's been a tough one the past couple of years, especially. You saw that dramatic drop off of Elegant Trogan and the surveys we did. I feel like Montezuma quail, we haven't done surveys for them, but anecdotally, it, they've been hard to come by. A couple more birds here, and then we'll have some time for, for questions. Yeah, a little bit more talking. But this is another, uh, uh, this rosewood bacar is a type of a flight catcher. And uh, just probably within the past five or six years, they've really started to make themselves known here in, um, in the Southeast Arizona region. They kind of go through like um, ups and downs in their population cycles here. So when I first, uh, maybe about 10 years before I first moved here, they were kind of in an up cycle. And then when I arrived here in like 2014, 2015, they're kind of in the down cycle. And then since I arrived, they really started going up again and they've been increasing in number, especially in along the river corridors. So, you know, like Montezuma quail, red-faced warbler, they're tied to higher elevation. Rose or Picard, they are more tied to uh, the river corridors. So the Santa Cruz River, which flows from south to north, flows north uh, up towards Tucson from Mexico, all along that corridor uh, is good habitat for Rose or Picard. And then also up the Samoda Creek, Patagonia area. And uh, this is uh, a male up here. You can see a little bit of the rose throat here. And this is either a female or a young bird. Uh, Most of the birds have amazing nests. So one reason why they're tied to the river corridors is that their nests are often way up high in the cottonwood trees. And they make their nest. You can see there, did I put a, oh, I thought I had a circle. So this is the nest right here. It's a little ball that hangs at the end of the branch over the river. So it's kind of football shaped and um, they enter it from my low. So they don't come in from the top, they enter it from below and they go up and they have their nest in there and it hangs out over so the, the creek or the river. And that's where they fly catch and get all their food there and stay way up high in the canopy. And it's almost as cool to see a rose or a nest as it is the actual bird. It, it's just, this is kind of a, I'm, I guess kind of a poor picture. I wish I had a better one, but um, it's just amazing to see the nest over the over the river there. So I haven't talked uh, about any hawks yet, but we actually are coming up on one of my favorite times of the year, the month of March. The month of March, also where the, the cards are at on San Cruz River, is it? our hawk migration that starts. And actually this is the best spot in the whole world to see large concentrations of common black hawks. So the hawk watch with Hawk International, Hawk Watch International starts 
March 1st and goes through the whole month. But really the best time is on the middle of March, really around like the 12th or the 15th. And um, we all meet at a at a park in a town south of Tucson called Tubac. And at this park, hundreds of people get together. And at about nine o'clock, all of a sudden, these common black hawks will start circling up from the cottonwoods where they roost for the night. And they'll go up and then they'll fly right over us. So it may not sound like a lot, but on good days, we'll have anywhere from 70 to 100 common black hawks flying over us. And it, it's a very, like another range restricted bird that uh, you won't see in very many other places in the United States. But the vast majority of them breed just north of Tucson, like uh, in the river corridors. And they all come up from Sonora and further south of Mexico up that Santa Cruz River. It's not just common black hawks, it's also zoetail uh, hawks and later in the month, swings and hawks. And of course, red tails and sometimes you get golden eagles. Um, but another really good one is this guy. This is Greyhawk. The Greyhawk is really common all throughout the riparian zones of Southeast Arizona. I think, you know, just like I said, violet crown hummingbird is my favorite hummingbird. This is my favorite raptor, the Greyhawk. The kind of um, kind of body shape and kind of look of maybe like a broad wing hawk, kind of. Um, that's about the size they are. Uh, they have an amazing call. Let me play this call here. Kind of blood curdling the first time you hear it. <laughs> Needed a longer one. Whoops. Can't do that. So, um, in fact, we have a couple of gray hawks that are overwintering in at, at the patent center this year, which is pretty interesting. Normally, don't have them overwinter, but they arrive in like early to mid March, and then usually they just stick around till like the end of September, first part of October, and then they're out and headed south into Mexico, down into Costa Rica, uh, Central America there. But this guy, uh, not just a repairing zone, but also into some of the oak grassland areas, same area type of habitat that you would find Montezuma quail. They they do get up into that area as well. Um, I mentioned our Southeast Arizona Birding Festival. So it's happening in August. It's August 9th to 13th this year. And um, yeah, this is a guy holding the, the picture of a light bird that he got, the Greyhawk. Um, but it's really one of the funnest events that uh, that I get to be a part of. I love festi birding festivals. So I don't know if any of you have ever been to, to one, whether it's uh, Biggest Week of Birding in Ohio or San Diego Bird Festival or Space Coast. Uh, have the big one at Space Coast in Florida. Um, but if you're interested in those, I'd love to talk with you more about Southeast Arizona Birding Festival and why you should come to Tucson in August. The question that everyone gives me is, is it hot there in August? Yeah, it is, but that's, the birds are fantastic. And you can bird early in the morning and get away with it and not, uh, not harsh yourself out too much and take it easy in the afternoons and go back out in the evening when the monsoon rains come. It's, it's pretty amazing. So uh, I, I hope to see you in out birding in Southeast Arizona sometime. I'm always happy to answer any questions about like if you're visiting, like where should you go? We have a lot of field trip options for people. You don't have to be a member to go on the field trips. Um, the, this, this right here, let's see, I'm trying to remember. It looks like it's Sycamore Canyon down in the Parito Mountains. This is west of Nogales, right along the border. Excellent spot for elegant trogan. Excellent spot for Montezuma quail. One of my favorite locations. I think this is a picture taken during the festival. And um, yeah, I I could talk on and on about the birds of Southeast Arizona. I, if you guys have any other questions right now, I'm happy to take them.